DILR, DILR, BARC, no QA. That's interesting. I think in the next session, we'll get QA as the answer. <clears throat> <laughs> I guess DILR is the phobia for most of the candidates. Yes. Yeah, I think because uh, if you of the unpredictability mess up one, one yeah, if you mess up one set, uh, the whole section goes for a toss. Anmol cat is unpredictable. Even BRC and QA are also unpredictable. Mm. Yeah, actually, that's, that's kind of true. That's true. true. Yeah, but you could argue you don't actually have to be taught how to solve puzzles in the sense that no one can actually teach you how to crack some sort of LR set at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just that that mindset is not inculcated. Since yeah, mindset, I agree. Yeah. Like the yeah. whole strategy and stuff. Right? But also, the time see, there are ways to go around it. Like, uh, if you follow the right steps, we can't guarantee you that you know uh, you'll always score well in DILR, uh, but the chances of scoring well uh, improve drastically if you if you follow a set procedure. And we'll talk about this procedure also. Man, do you have a question or uh, is your mic just not on you? Hey everyone, good afternoon. So actually, I think somebody wrote in the comments that LR, because it's very unpredictable, and uh, you know, this is one of the concerns that we're going to address in the uh, presentation today, that a lot of people are afraid of the, uh, you know, the variety of sets that CAT can throw at you, right? Like uh, there's, there's this uh, perception that every year CAT uh, comes up with a new set type that we have not seen before, and how will we tackle that? So we're going to talk about how you can use the first principles or the very basics and, you know, uh, like no matter what kind of unfamiliar set that is, you can uh, solve that. Uh, that should not be a problem for you. Uh, it's not a matter of luck, selection of sets, uh, you know, uh, like Bhaskar and Mridul will walk you through their own process, like they've created their own matrix and their own, uh, you know, set selection scores, how they assign uh, the scores to a particular set. So it it's more of a mathematical model than a stroke of luck, I would say. And if you follow their process, I can guarantee it's very robust and you should be able to pick the right sets and not get stuck in the death valley. That is something that you know can really help you if you uh, know how to pick the right set. Sartak, I think we can start. It's already 12 weeks. Yeah, uh, are we expecting more participants? I just see 75 people on the call. I think we can yeah. start. More people will join in as time goes on, but I think we should start now. Uh, Sartak, you're on mute. Yeah, so sorry, so sorry. Yeah, sure, we, we can we can start. Uh, Maridul, are you there on the call? Yeah, I was just configuring the tab for the. No worries, man. So, uh, guys, before we begin, we would like to run some polls just to have a vibe check of the group. So, uh, can I request Team Inside IM to run the polls for us? Yeah, there goes the first one. Guys, be honest when you guys answer. Yeah, yeah. We are just trying to understand the audience here. There's no judgment whatsoever. Please be very honest.
right i still see that some people are uh, yet to answer this okay awesome so uh, i think we can end this poll uh, and i have the results in front of me uh, it's clear that almost 80% people on this group uh, can solve between one to two sets and uh, like on the outliers like there's only uh, like 20% of the people but most of you are plateaued between one to two sets and uh, that is something that we are going to address today how you can break that plateau how you can uh, you know make the most out of uh, being in this zone so uh, definitely that's there uh, however there are some people who say that dilr gives them living nightmares uh, and we'll address that as well how you can uh, strategically improve your dilr and at least make it through the cutoffs and you can compensate through the rest of the sections if it's like uh, you know really coming to that uh, can we run the next poll i think this this was a good check i think uh, i'm happy with how the audience responded to this yeah interesting I guess Varnit might be looking at this pretty nicely. This poll, <laughs> and I'm amazed. So many people think that you need three sets. You know, three sets. If you have if if you solve three sets, you're going to probably get a hundred percentile. And I think Bridul can attest to it from his own experience that three sets for yeah. ninety nine is not at all needed. Maybe not even two complete sets. Like three sets is like ninety nine point seven easy. but yeah, the pickup yeah. bazi did not work out for me guys just by the way <laughs> i got one correct and three incorrect so that was a net of zero <laughs> no in fact i think mayank is saying that two or three depending on the difficulty level of the paper uh, in fact mayank i can show you trends from the last 3 years and i can tell you that it's never been three sets for 99th percentile two sets is more than enough Awesome. Can we have the next question? You know, let's just clarify. This is each and not the collective eight of us. Ah, this is this is individual, lah. By the way. Tedul, how many sets did you solve? Someone. Yeah, I mean, I haven't counted them, but it would be close to what Vipul is saying. I think, yeah, must have crossed a thousand. But again, it is not so much about quantity as it is about quality. When I tell you about the ways I went about practicing them or what my approach was, then you will get much more clarity as to why I was able to do. 
well so yeah numbers are not very important it is about what you learn from the approaches that you take and we can end this poll also i'm just trying to configure my screen and i'm struggling a bit with it so i'm not able to answer questions just give me two minutes guys baskar would you like to share how many sets did you solve in the last one year or in the last three years combined uh last four years if i were to say probably more than 2500 but last year i would say close to 6 to 700 not many so guys that is really the take away i mean the more you practice in this section uh, you know the more diverse uh, genre of set you are going to encounter you are going to you know make yourself familiar with so practice is non negotiable in this uh, i mean there is there is no substitute uh, there is no coaching there is no magic mantra for dilr it is sheer number of sets quality sets analysis of those sets that's the thing in this uh, more uh, than the number of sets it's that you are reaching the solution on your own not looking at the solutions or the solution videos because for dilr they are of least if you look at the solutions or the solution videos guys we'll come to the resources later yeah we we have that covered have let's questions. move to the last poll question and then we can start with the presentation yeah. okay awesome guys i think uh, it's evident that almost 70% of you enjoy the preparation just crunch for time and uh, you know we will also highlight uh, later during the session how you can make the most of your time and uh, you know optimize your score but it, it's good to see that you know majority of you are uh, enjoying the prep it's keeping you on your toes so that that's like very healthy uh, you know as a mentor to know that awesome uh, so i think uh, we have a good uh, judgment of the crowd today amridul um, if you would if you are okay we can start with the presentation yeah so before that we can ask them if they got some time to look at the questions that we sent and if there are some solutions for them to share with us yeah guys can you put it in the comments please if you had a chance to go through the questions yeah so if anyone would like to volunteer to share their approaches they can unmute and share you can yeah. first raise your hand and then we will tell yeah we would love to see your approaches good to see yeah six seven people solved the first problem good to see did anyone uh, solve all three of the puzzles that we sent yesterday and i hope you all didn't look at the solutions <laughs> Yeah, okay. those are fairly standard puzzles if you look yeah. over the internet you will be able to find them vivek you can share your approach yeah go ahead go ahead yeah hello hello team good morning everyone so for the first set uh, the cat, uh, the cat set which was on the patient and uh, patient group which was for the test group and the controlling no no group. vivek we'll so, come to the sets later uh, we are talking about the three puzzles, puzzles. The, the three puzzles oh 
Oh, sorry, the puzzles. Uh, actually, I solved the sets directly, so I haven't had a chance to look at Okay, we will come to the sets. Anyone else yeah. for the puzzles? Yeah, sure, Anmul. Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, you can walk us through your solution. All right. Hi, guys. Anmul, the set. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, we can hear you. Anmul. Hi, we can hear you. All right, all right. So, first puzzle was, I guess, uh, we had two wires. the gold bar. Like that. Okay, okay, the gold bar. Yeah. So, the solution that I approach is, we can... There is no way we can cut a cube or like anything into seven equal pieces. So we'll have to like bifurcate them in such a way that we can exchange them in such a way. Because we cannot con uh, we cannot cut a cube or any cube in seven equal pieces. So we'll make, I guess, three cuts uh, such that uh, three of them are of two X lengths and the last one is X length. And we can exchange them one by one. Like on the first day, we'll give the X uh, let the, the first one, X length, and on the second day, we'll give the two X length one and bring back the X one in such a manner like this. Okay, so you make three cuts, so there will be four pieces, right? According uh, four to four pieces, yes, three of two X length and one of X length. Okay, can you try to optimize that a bit more with fewer cuts? Do you think it is possible? You can think about it. And if anyone else wants to pitch in, they can. So I haven't read the uh, read the puzzle, but uh, from what Anmol is saying, so if we are if we were to cut a cube, uh, we don't really require three cuts as such. But so as to optimize, we can do one cut from above and then slicing it from between, so we can actually have four pieces from two cuts. No, no, it is not really about that. It is about basically you have a cube, uh, you have a gold bar. Okay. okay. And uh, it is suppose 7 kgs, right? Now you have to cut it in such a way that you can give one piece uh, to the person uh, every day and you are able to pay the wage that like on the first day 1 kg, second day 2 kg, 3 kg, like uh, every day you are able to give him 1 kg for the work that they are doing. That is the puzzle. Uh, so you, you have a seven it as, uh, the most right. brute force method would be to cut it into seven uh, six pieces uh, six cuts seven pieces right and you give them one piece every day that is like the most basic approach now your task is to optimize this approach making them uh, fewer cuts yeah yeah so i think mayank, i think mayank uh, got it if mayank yeah. would be it would be nice if you could uh, unmute and explain the approach Okay, is my yeah. So, uh, Sartak, do you want to go ahead and explain it? Yeah, surely, surely, guys. So, uh, you know, this is a classic example of, uh, you know, using the powers of two to solve this question. So what you essentially do is uh, you realize that let's make the first cut, right, at uh, one, because you really need to pay him one unit for the first day, right? So that first cut is absolutely necessary. Now that you have made this cut, on the second day, you need to give this person two units. So what you can do, you can either make a cut on the second uh, mark or you can make a cut on the third mark and you can give him two units. So take back that one unit, give him two units. Now, on the third day, you, he already has two units. So you give him one extra unit, right? Now you have completed three days and you have four units of the bar left. So what you do now, you give it, take all of that away from him you take all of that away from him. And on the fourth day, you give him the four units, right? So you see, uh, basically by cutting it in the powers of two, from day one to day seven, you can actually make all the combinations using just the two cuts, using just the one bar, two bar, and the four bars, right? So, uh, you know, this is a concept that you will commonly come across in a lot of puzzles, uh, which will have similar variations. And uh, you can use the power of two to create any uh, sum from, uh, you know, from one to two to the power n minus one, essentially. So here n is three, there are three cuts. So two to the power three is eight, eight minus one is seven. So from one to seven, you can make any combination. I, I, I hope uh, I'm able to make sense here. 
if anyone has any doubts they can ask we would like this session to be a bit more interactive because it involves using your brains and going along with it so we would like to know if you are understanding it yes yes okay great i think a lot of people have understood so uh, moving on to the second puzzle did anyone get a chance to solve the second puzzle which was about the two wires how would you measure 45 minutes uh, by you know observing two wires burn uh samket anmol avinash any one of you can unmute yourself and you know walk us through your solution for this okay so i shall go ahead we have two wires and more or less they are of unequal width throughout the because they are taking different times to uh, different speeds to burn out uh, and they will burn out in 60 minutes all right so we'll start the ignition on one wire from both the sides and on the second wire from one side so that in 30 minutes we can complete the first wire completely burn out and in the 30 in the those 30 minutes the second wire is half cut out not necessarily half but it is somewhat cut out we have measured 30 minutes from it the rest of the wire that is left in the the last 30 minutes we can ignite it from both from both the sides and it will burn out in 15 minutes so in such a way we can measure like 30 plus 15 45 minutes like this i guess yeah yeah absolutely uh, spot on anmol and uh, himanshu is right uh, this is a puzzle that we uh, you know used from the internet and it's one of the most popular puzzles that people uh, you know like to solve for brain teasers so uh, you know what we want to highlight by giving you these puzzles is that dilr is not just about solving sets you know it's also a lot about equipping your brain to think more logically now you can go on tenali rama you can go on uh, geeks for geeks you can do sudoku you just need various ways to you know stimulate your brain uh, on an everyday basis so that uh, you can see patterns you can see uh, you know logical uh, patterns forming so amritul would you like to take this up further uh, for the third puzzle and so on and the josephus yeah. yeah so anyone who has solved the third puzzle and if someone can tell me what the third puzzle was <laughs> yeah so the third puzzle was there are 100 doors and you take 100 passes at them at every pass uh, you open the one second on the first pass you pass you visit every door and if it's closed you open it on the second pass you uh, visit every second door on the third pass you visit every third door and so on so okay so there are some doubts from the previous puzzle in the comments should we just address them first while burning the second wire from both ends how can we be sure if rate of burning from the second end of the second wire is same as that as it's uh, burning from its half end if it is nothing is mentioned why we will assume the same rate of burn we can't assume like different rates of burning yeah, the material is get... homogeneous right and it doesn't it matter like rate of burning it doesn't matter to... yes so i'll just continue yeah so uh, what essentially we are doing is at the first pass we are opening every every door and the second pass we are opening every second door the third pass we are opening every third door so what we are doing is uh, in the first pass it is multiples of 1 the second pass it is multiples of 2 the second third pass it is multiples of 3 so in the first pass uh, all the doors were closed so now all the doors are open after the first pass after the second pass uh, now we'll go to door 2 door 4 door 6 door 8 and they were all open so we'll close them uh, can someone just note this down and uh, try to find a pattern in this in the third pass we'll go to door 3 now door 3 is closed currently we'll open it Uh, then we go to door six. Now door six has been opened in the second pass. Now we'll uh, close it, or was it the other way around? I think it was closed. Now we'll open it. Similarly, uh, what you observe is that uh, the doors which are at perfect squares, they are uh, visited at odd number of times. 
while the other doors are visited even number of times. And uh, you observe that these are the doors that will remain open at the end of the puzzle. Yeah, so uh, was that very clear? Basically, you have to keep in mind that every number has uh, an even number of factors except yeah. the prime numbers. So prime number, basically, if you look at 9 or 16, they have repeated square factors. Numbers. Square numbers. Perfect square. Numbers yeah, sorry, sorry, my bad, my bad. I should have said square instead of prime. I'm so sorry. Yeah, the square numbers, essentially, they have an odd number of factors. Like 9 is 3 into 3, 16 is 4 into 4, 25 is 5 into 5. And all other numbers, they have an even pair of factors. So that is the concept that we are using here. Great. So I think you have had uh, a flavor of what uh, different kind of puzzles look like. Uh, we have also compiled some puzzles for you to do as homework that we'll share at the end of this session. So uh, for now, we can start with our presentation. Uh, it's a short presentation. We'll keep it interactive. We'll try to solve a couple of sets for you guys. And then we can open the floor for Q&A. So uh, I'll share the screen. Uh, let me know once my screen is visible to all of you. Is my screen visible? Yes. Guys, can you see? Yeah, yeah it's visible. Oh, uh, yes. Perfect. yes. Perfect. Perfect. So the entire aim of uh, you know ours is to demystify DLR for you. There's a lot of uh, you know lot of anxiety that's going around DLR. You know, it's like that one section which uh, gives the sleepless nights to all test takers. And we just want to make it very easy for you to consume, to see it very logically, to see it, you know, very structurally and not get overwhelmed by this section. Because trust us, this is the make or break section for you in your CAT exam. Right? Yeah. So we'll cover, uh, you know, what DILR is about, uh, what are the particular aspects of DLR which haunt the test takers, uh, how you can learn some tricks of the trade, uh, what have been some historical trends, uh, where is it that you can practice the, uh, you know, sets, beginner level to high quality sets? What are different solving styles? Uh, as you'll see that we, all of us have different solving styles, even in the panelists. And then we'll uh, walk you through a couple of sets that will solve life for you. So, Mridul, would you like to walk them through the first couple of slides? Sure. So, DILR. So, uh, DILR is the data interpretation and logical reasoning section, which is the second section in the CAT examination, followed by the, uh, which is immediately after the verbal section and which is followed by the QA section. So a lot of aspirants feel that DILR, they are really scared of the DILR section. So what are the some common, uh, uh, so uh, in CAT 22, there were four puzzles of five questions each. Uh, earlier in CAT, in the previous two years, there were four sets, uh, which has two sets were of six questions each and two sets were of four questions each. So there was this preconceived notion that the questions with four sets were comparatively easier than the sets which had six questions. And a lot of aspirants went with the mindset that they would uh, target those sets and try to like get them all correct and then uh, maybe clear the cutoff or score a good uh, enough percentile and uh, clear the section. I would like to say that you should not have any such preconceived notions when you are going uh, for this section. You should always try to identify uh, while practicing which are the types of sets that you are comfortable in doing. So uh, here are some of the buckets under which we would classify the DLR puzzles. So the first one is data interpretation, which has a lot of pie charts, bar graphs, tables that are presented to you. And essentially you are uh, asked question on them where you have to read the table, understand, interpret, and then answer the questions. Then there comes quant based puzzles, which involve a lot of uh, mathematics. Sometimes you will have uh, to form equations, find patterns in the numbers, something very similar to the puzzles that we discussed below uh, earlier. Next comes arrangements where you are asked to arrange uh, people in a line uh, or in a circular arrangement or simply table filling questions, right? And these are uh, so in these, there are two kinds of questions that come. Some questions have a lot of data to process and some would have very few points. Uh, a lot of aspirants feel that the ones which have a few points are easier to solve, but it is actually the other way around because the more data you have, the more you can, uh, the less work you have to do on your own to visualize or to interpret it in a different way. For example, uh, 
if there are a few statements, then there are a lot of things that you have to deduce on your own while solving the sets, right? Next is Venn diagrams, which are a pretty standard, a very pretty standard questions come from there and you can really uh, understand and master them through practice. Then there are some games and tournaments uh, which have been uh, a pain for many aspirants in the past few attempts. I think we'll cover that later in the session. Then there are rules and networks and then there are miscellaneous sets which uh, cover uh, multiple of these topics, right? So we can move on to the next. Uh, but the main agenda of sharing these, uh, you know, different set types is that, you know, this is the bare basics that you should be comfortable with. You know, over and above this, there will always be some mix and match and, you know, some new kind of sets that are getting created every day. But these are the, you know, largely the broader types of sets that are there. And uh, if not anything, you should at least familiarize yourself with these set types from yeah, DI to Roots and Networks. Which ones you are good at? Yeah, so you can rank them based on difficulty, right? So when we assign difficulty scores to sets, we all have different approaches to them. I might be comfortable in games and tournaments, while Sarthak Bhai might be comfortable solving Venn diagrams. So that we realize through a lot of practice. Right, moving on. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll take up this one, the devil in DILR, right? Why DILR actually haunts the test takers? So in our experience, DILR is, you know, primarily very scary for these three reasons. The first is that, uh, you know, people are really scared of unpredictable question types. So, you know, while we agree that it's true that, you know, CAT over the years has its penchant for innovating new set types, but there's also something that if you have really mastered the basics in the previous uh, slide, as we uh, mentioned, right, you can really tackle any new kind of set using the first principles or the basics, right? So the fundamentals re remain the same. It's just uh, the visual, uh, you know, the visuals that are changed. It's just the way the information that's presented to you that's changed. For example, I vividly remember. Yeah, I vividly remember in the CAT 2021 slot three, there was a Gantt chart set. Now, Gantt chart is something that people are not used to seeing on an everyday basis, right? So they saw a very scary looking chart and they just left the set. But if you actually spent like even five minutes on that set, you would have realized it's just another type of bar graph. It's nothing different. You just had to read the chart and you had to answer the question. It was a, like the lowest hanging fruit in that entire uh, section. And you could have done it in like five minutes. So that's what, uh, you know, don't be scared. Don't be afraid of new question types. They are all derived from the same fundamentals. So if you are really strong at that, you should not be, uh, you know, really uh, apprehensive about, uh, you know, what cat might throw at you. It could be a spider web, it could be a GAN chart, it could be anything, right? Uh, then a lot of people are also, uh, you know, anxious about getting stuck in the wrong set. So, uh, you know, like this is undeniably, I, you know, we agree that this is one of the worst nightmares that what if you get stuck in a wrong set? What if you are not able to find a way out of it? So for this, uh, you know, we have uh, like all of us in the panel, we have our own approach and how we select the set, right? And uh, this approach that we're going to talk about is something we have derived over the years, uh, you know, over the years of practicing hundreds and thousands of sets. So, uh, you know, I'll uh, recommend, uh, you know, Bhaskar and Mridul, if you can share your approaches, how you assign the score to every set, right? And how do you decide which set to choose and which to not? That would really help the test takers on, uh, you know, minimizing their chances of getting stuck in the wrong one. So, Bhaskar, Mridul, can you, like, walk yeah, sure. through your process? Yeah, sure, I will go ahead. So, I selected sets on the basis of two parameters. One was familiarity with the sets, type of sets, and the other was complexity of the sets. So like you can make a two by two matrix. So if you are familiar, uh, like I would divide these sets into three categories again, easy, medium, and tough for me. So if I see a set which is familiar to me and I see that it is not complex, like uh, suppose there is a table filling set and you are given three parameters. Okay, so it is not complex, so it becomes easy set for me. Then second one, uh, sets are unfamiliar, but are not complex. And sets which are familiar, but looking complex. So these two categories become medium level sets for me. And the sets which are unfamiliar and are complex become tough sets for me, which I will not bother seeing also or reading also in the exam. Okay. Now, you need to practice a lot. You need to experiment in the mocks, in the sectionals to find your approach right. And it is not that 
uh, every time you will select the correct sets only you will get stuck in a wrong set like sarthak told ki uh, 21 slot 3 there was a gantt chart now i left that set i did not even look at it because i did not like calculations in di in the exam uh, rather i like games and tournament set and i got stuck in the javelin set so it is fine you get stuck but you need to learn that uh, even the topics which you are strong in you may be strong in arrangement you may be strong in games and tournament but in the exam actual exam that from that topic the toughest set might come and like if you are stuck 7 to 8 minutes i would say move on move on from that set there are a lot of questions lot of sets to be solved there can always be exceptions okay. like baskar mentioned right all of us who attempted that slot we got stuck in the javelin set because we were all very familiar with games and tournaments type but then the complexity of that set was through the roof so you know all of us got stuck in that so it's okay you know like even the seasoned test takers they get stuck in the wrong set sometimes but the more you practice the better you'll be able to assign the familiarity and complexity score so uh, you know those are the two things that uh, you have to practice and you will get better at uh, how to how to assign those scores uh, yeah i would like to add one point here so if you just look at these three points right uh, they cover the the overall aspect very well and i'll tell you why how to break each of these three points right when you see unpredictable question types understand that all the types of questions that you'll see will will seem fairly new to you although there are some underlying principles like if it's a arrangement question they might introduce some di points to it but it will still stay a arrangement set right so the basics remain the same and then they interchange different types to make new questions so unpredictability in question types will always be there and you have to get used to solving new types of questions that's first second is stuck in the wrong set so the entire mock season will be spent in getting out of that wrong set right so sometimes you'll choose the right set you'll spend time there you'll solve it fine but you, there'll, there'll be many more times when you get stuck in the wrong set and you have to learn the ability through the mocks to soon uh, realize that this is the wrong set and get out of it and in the third one go big or go home uh, yes this is a myth that you have to solve all five questions because sometimes you can solve only two or three questions that are very easy and the other remaining one or two questions might have you take additional information into consideration so you don't need to do those two or three questions you can move on to a simpler set in fact uh, of the two sets that we gave you uh, in the pdf yesterday if you look at the first set on the medicines even if you just consumed all the information that's presented in the set information you could have done two out of the four questions and the remaining two would have required some calculations that you could have avoided if you were like really crunched for time so the moral is that it's not always uh, you know you have to solve the set completely you can just look at the glance at the information and even uh, by the basis of that you can uh, you know like capture one or two low hanging fruits so always keep an eye out for this because this is what is going to differentiate you from other test takers okay uh, moving on right so here are some uh, you know tricks that we have compiled over our years of solving dilr uh, on you know how you can uh, really sharpen your mind how you can really you know get your mind ready and in the group uh, and you know just not uh, make the same mistakes that a common test taker does so mridul uh, would you like to walk them uh, through these uh, five steps sure so i would first like to get to talk a bit about my approach that when i started solving dilr sets so that was somewhere around january last year so uh, as a as someone who was very new to solving dilr uh, and i am from software background so people who would solve coding problems would know that first we approach a coding problem from the brute force approach what the brute force approach essentially means is that you just try to get the solution you don't really worry about the time it is taking you to solve the question solve the question then uh, what we move on to doing is we try to optimize the set that is uh, we try to reduce the time complexity that essentially what it takes us to run the algorithm so that is something that i followed first i would uh, 
when I, when we start off, we are, I try to solve a set with all the information that is available to me uh, in front of me with the traditional method. And that might sometimes take me 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and even half an hour. And I would never shy away from spending that time to trying to solve that set. Uh, for me, it was never about uh, quantity that uh, today I want to do four sets or today I want to do six sets. It was always about quality that I derived from solving those sets. So uh, the first step was always to brute solve this question. Now, uh, when I go back to the question, I try different approaches so as to reduce the time uh, taken to solve the set, which uh, which essentially could be something like uh, using the options to backtrack uh, to the question and solve the table faster. So uh, a lot of these DILR sets have numbers as their answers. And I am someone who really loves numbers because every number has certain properties uh, that they that is unique to them. For example, it could be that a number is a prime number. The number is a multiple of two, a multiple of three, a multiple of five, and so on. So uh, when I'm solving the set, I try to notice some of these patterns which might be possible in the answer. So uh, when I'm at a stage, for example, when I understand that the number is suppose a multiple of 10, and I see that out of the four options, a couple of options are not multiples of 10. I can straight away eliminate them and maybe use the other two options that to make my process faster. This is one of the tricks out of the many that uh, I developed over practice every day, day in and day out. It is not something that just came to me or just someone told me and I did them, right? I can share these with you, uh, but it is more like you have to practice a lot and try to incorporate them in your own uh, methods. Yeah, so uh, that is what essentially uh, backtracking from the options, which is 0.5 means. Uh, another important point is don't, uh, when you're solving a set, the, the goal is to get the answer to the questions. It is not to fill the entire table. Sometimes uh, people are so fixated on getting all the, uh, filling all the boxes that are present in the table, which are not even necessary to get to the answer because the questions might have multiple cases or something like that, which you would only realize after reading the questions. So when a question is presented to you, uh, uh, when a set is presented to you, you should first read all the questions and understand whether uh, there is a definite answer to each of the questions or there are multiple cases possible. That could also help you decide whether to attempt that set or not. Right. Uh, so uh, apart from that, I already spoke about don't, not being fixated on set targets, not being fixated on solving easier sets or like focusing on doing, on only doing a particular areas, covering some particular areas, right? Like, so I had slot one and we did not have any DI set, which is uh, considered to be the easiest set to have in a paper. And a lot of aspirants did struggle. That is why slot one uh, was, DILR was termed to be the toughest and it was scaled up quite a bit. But uh, yeah, so you should be prepared for any scenario which comes up in the examination. You should never be very complacent or uh, play to your, uh, I mean, you have to play to your strengths, but never too comfortable to not expect surprises. When, especially when you are dealing with the DILR section. So, you know, some also, people uh, come with this uh, mindset that, uh, you know, uh, uh, like four sets will be there, two will be DI, two will be LR. So it's okay if I've done only DI in my preparation, I'll still be able to crack two sets out of four. Okay. So it doesn't work that way, essentially. Actually, in the recent years, the sets which are coming are a combination of both DI and LR. Purely DI and purely LR sets are like in the last two, three years, they have stopped coming. I think Varnit yes. wanted to add something. I cut him off yes. by mistake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah we can uh, hear you, Varnit. So, yes. Uh, what I wanted to point out is that uh, I interacted with the faculty, uh, the ILR faculty, and he told me one thing that, you know, he has been observing that uh, since past few years, uh, that has been playing a lot around summation of numbers. For example, it will give you that sum of four single digit uh unique numbers uh that is 29 and there is only one way to form that 9875 right so what cat has been doing is that it has been, it has started giving you small sums and you have to figure out you know what can be the possible set of numbers and that is something that has been coming year after year this time around in first set uh first lot i remember there was this goals set. question yeah yes the goals question and then uh, last year, I think there was this delivery set or something. So, you know, that has been playing a lot around these numbers. And, uh, you know, when you start taking mocks, you will notice that, you know, there are sets that revolve around this. There's so a very famous uh, Japanese game called Kakuro. If you want Kakuro, to practice yes. what Varnit is saying, you should really check out Kakuro. 
So uh, I would solve a lot of Sudoku's, Kakuro's, and then there are these games on Play Stores which have escaping games. You know, it is under escaping game genres. So essentially, what you have to do is uh, at every stage you're supposed to escape from a room, and there are some puzzles that you need to solve. You need to find some objects which are hidden in the room. I mean, these kind of things really help you stimulate your brain, and I really found them very useful. I uh, think the I game mean... you are talking about is the room. Yeah, the room. The puzzle. Yeah, yeah, there are many such games available. You can try out. Yeah, yeah. and just to add one more point, I think Rishikesh here also raised a uh, question, and uh, so this needs to be clarified. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Uh, yeah, yeah. So in in this is one of shouldn't call this a trick, but uh, what I found out was if I have and this is very like going into the weeds of the box, right? paper suddenly you see that okay maybe three fourth of the three fourth of the paper is finished rough space is finished and you have some space there and you start a di set there and uh, let's say it's making a table and there are four or five parameters that you need to fill suddenly you realize that there's not enough space in the table and as you're filling more information in you realize okay the space is almost completely over you've wasted time or you've spent some time and now you need to move on to a next page, right? All of these little small, small things, I'll call them and I'll bucketize them into being unorganized. So all of these small things actually affect you in the DILR section a lot, because not only are you trying to fill in so much information and figure out how to solve the set, but your focus should in that time frame should not go on to small, small issues like, you know, I don't have much space, so I have to write smaller text or I have to uh, fit all of this into one single space and then I don't have rough space anymore. Basically, if you if you're a lot more organized, yes, it will take a few more few extra seconds while drawing a good table, but it will save you a lot more time overall. Yeah, then and just to waste uh, time there. Yeah, just to add on to this point, uh, making this organized table is pretty much all that took my score from an overall 99.9 to a 99.96. Those 10 extra marks were from two questions in DILR that I cracked in like the last three minutes or so. And I could only do that because I had noted down the information and then, you know, it kind of clicked in the last two minutes. So, and I didn't have to do the entire puzzle again because I had the information in front of me. So this is very important. Yeah, and if you, uh, let's say you'll, you'll buy a test series, right? And you'll see some video in, video uh, solutions of those tests uh, or of those sets. You'll realize that the person who is presenting his screen or his PPT, uh, they are able to solve the set like very easily. One reason for that is also because they are doing it on a screen and they're being very, very structured. It's not just knowing the solution. It's that they're writing that solution in a very, structured manner as in they're presenting the solution in a structured manner so if you follow that follow the structure also so if you're making a table uh make the table equally spaced out or all the columns equally spaced out and uh, present the information in your solution in the right manner that, so that actually you don't have to beautify it like don't, yeah, don't beautify, beautify it, it. Yeah. you are doing but at least don't make it so uh, confusing that even you are stuck that you know what is it that uh, you wrote uh, a second ago. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's the difference between being cluttered and uncluttered. Right. So a lot of times it also happens that, you know, uh, like uh, in the haste, you write some number and you, uh, you know, like you come back to it after a minute and you are not able to read it properly and you think of it as something else and then you mark a wrong option because of that. So don't make your, uh, you know, table clumsy. You don't have to really beautify it, but make it readable and make it organized. That, that's what you want to communicate. Perfect. I think this is the slide that most of you were awaiting. Uh, you know, what are the marks versus percentile for the last two years? So if you look at this slide, right, I'll just give you a, like 10, 15 seconds to consume this and let it really sink in.
So remember earlier in the uh, session we ran a poll and uh, people said that it takes three to four sets to score a 99th percentile. And if you see here, the 99th percentile for the last two years has been around 30 marks. 30 marks is two sets, right? So if you solve just two sets correctly, you are getting a 99th percentile, which is like the dream score to have on any day. And if you're just able to do like half a set more, you're hitting a 99.5, right? So that's one of the key takeaways that you should have, like solving about 2.5 sets is really enough to get you 99.5 and above. You don't need to go into three sets, all the four sets, don't have to solve the entire paper. You just have to solve what you think is doable from that paper. You can, you really have the luxury of choosing what to solve. It's not something that you have to solve everything like, uh, you know, it's, it's there in probably quant that, you know, people are under pressure, we have to solve everything. In DILR, you just can solve 50% or maybe less of that section and you can get a 99th percentile. And if you look at the cutoff, right, 80th percentile, which is a standard cutoff, 12 marks and 15 marks. That's like one set, one set. That's all it takes to clear the cutoff. And, you know, this is something I told in an earlier interview also, and I'll repeat it here for this audience. Whenever the question uh, paper setter, you know, he's setting the uh, particular section, he will ensure that whoever comes in the exam at least goes back with one set, right? He will ensure that nobody goes back empty-handed. So if there are four sets in the exam, one set is absolutely going to be setter. I have written five cats in my experience. There has never been at least, you know, one set jo, like, which, which is not doable. So just have to identify that one set out of the four. Like spend five minutes, scan through all the sets, identify that one set, which you really think the exam setter wants everybody in this exam to solve. If you just solve that one set, you have already cleared the cutoff. You have already cleared the 80th percentile. Anything above that is a bonus and will only take you further to 99th percentile. So one low hanging fruit, if you solve that, it will take you what, five minutes of scanning, 10 minutes of solving. 15 minutes, you have 15 marks secured. Then you have 25 minutes to solve the second set. And if you do that, second set in 25 minutes with the added confidence of having already cleared the cutoff, you're hitting 99th. You see, it's really that easy. You know, a lot of people are stuck between 80 and 99. They're not able to clear the cutoff because they, they don't see it this way. They just, you know, they are afraid. They are overwhelmed of the DLR section. But it's really that easy. You know, one I mean, set. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, sir. Uh, so one more point to add here. Uh, on like we have told you that you have to select the set right, right? Uh, what people do is while selecting, they start prioritizing on which is the uh, which set I'll solve first, then which set I'll solve second, which set I'll solve third, and then fourth, right? Uh, I'll change this process a little bit, and it'll it'll seem so much easier, right? Just identify the easiest set. That's all. Now you'll tell me that you know both of these approaches we're doing essentially the same thing. No, you're not. When you're making, when you're ranking all the four sets, it takes a lot more brain power. When you're finding out the easiest set, it takes a little less brain power. And this actually affects you during the testing scenario, right? Now think about this. Till till the CAT twenty two happened, uh, we used to get. Uh, two types of sets. One was a six question set and another was a four question set. So it was two sets of four questions each, two sets of six questions each, totaling 20 questions. Naturally, if you are a set question paper setter, uh, which set would you make the easiest and which set would you make the hardest? Right? On a typical day, you would make a four question set the easiest and one six question set the hardest. And the middle two, one four set and one six set, will remain somewhere in the middle difficulty range. So what you have to first do is you don't have to look at four sets. You have to look at only two sets, which is four questions each, and then figure out which one of them is easier and then solve that first. Don't even look at the six questions. That's what I used to do. Now in CAT, they threw a Google. They said all of them will be five questions. Set, right? So essentially, I had to choose bit, not between two sets, but between four sets. Fair enough. But then I chose the easiest set. And I chose on the basis of two things, like familiarity, like Bhaskar mentioned, and uh, how long that set was should not be a parameter, but roughly you can take an uh, estimate. And if there are too many options and too many uh, statements given, 
it will take a long time to crack that cell. You also need to take a look at the questions that are coming. So just go about the questions and see if the questions are very direct questions as in uh, maybe who is person X paired with, right? This is a direct answer. But if the question states something like, if so-and-so happens, then X is paired with who? So you, you already know that this question is providing additional information. So even if I solve the set, I'll have to input this information and then I'll be able to come up, uh, then I'll come up with an answer. Naturally, this will take more time. So it's a more difficult test. So these are the differences between direct and indirect question types. So on the basis of that, you can find out which is the easiest set and the hardest set and always start with the easiest set, obviously. And DILR is also a lot about confidence. You know, the moment you know that you have hit one set out of the path in the first 10, 15 minutes, you're naturally more confident to move on to the subsequent sets. However, if you spend the first 20 minutes doing absolutely nothing, not even a single question, even if you were capable of solving more than that, your confidence tanks and you essentially succumb in the exam. So starting off with the right set is extremely essential in this section. Uh, I would just like to add one thing. In CAT, every set is designed to be solved in 10 to 12 minutes. It's not that some sets are designed to be solved in 40 minutes. Okay. Now, whenever you analyze the mocks, if in any set you took 20 minutes to solve, okay, it's fine. Attempt it again and then look at the solutions. In the solutions, like Avi mentioned and Tanaya mentioned about the importance of organizing the information in a structured manner. So there you will learn how the question taker has analyzed the, uh, how the question taker has presented the solution in an organized manner. So it is also very important in developing your skill for DILR. Right. Uh, so guys, someone asked, uh, sorry, just one thing. Someone asked to go for the familiar set or not, right? So in slot three this time, there was a set which was super familiar to, I think, me, Bhaskar and Sarthak, okay? And we happily chose it as the second set. And before we knew it, 20 minutes were up because that set was like very deceptive. Like it looked so easy, but it was almost incrackable, right? So know when to get out. Like don't just go like, Are, this looks easy. So let's just continue solving it. Just have one eye on the clock always. Yeah. If seven to eight minutes, you are not able to figure out anything, move on. Right, right. You can always uh, come back to it if the other sets are more challenging. But, uh, you know, like don't miss out on other easy sets like we did, uh, you know, like me and Bhaskar did in 2021 slot three. <laughs> we got stuck on the javelin set and we missed out on the Gantt chart. So yeah. uh, don't, don't repeat that mistake. And one more thing I would like to add is that... See, when you are solving the sets, you are picking the easier sets. So suppose you solve the one set and then again in the next set, you solve two questions. So in 15, 20 minutes, if you are done with seven questions, so you get a psychological uh, advantage also. You, your mindset becomes positive and it kind of helps in the remaining 20 minutes also. Like some sets which you thought you won't be able to crack, but you crack it. It happens with a lot of candidates. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we so, would really like you all to make these mistakes now. At least in the first four or five mocks, make these mistakes so that you can learn from them. Because we all made these mistakes sometime or the other. We just don't want you to make it on the D-Day eventually. Because if you don't make these mistakes, we will not remember them. We all learned from our own mistakes. So don't be afraid of making these mistakes. But just don't make them again if you are making them once. Yeah, and uh, just to add on to this, like taking a wrong set and uh, getting stuck on this, I think I faced this during my CAT and Varnit also had a very good strategy to this. Varnit is facing some audio issues, but I'll bring this up. What he used to do is he would not start the DILR section from the 40 minute mark. He would start it from either the 35 or 30 or 25 minute mark and then try to solve it. What that did was, let's say in the actual CAT, he would face a bad set and get stuck on it for the, let's say 10 or 15 minutes then uh firstly you have to overcome that psychological barrier so naturally when you're practicing from the 25 or 30 minute mark uh it gives you an additional you know muscle there uh not everyone will be able to do that but it's a it's a good strategy to to think about and to try 
uh, obviously you will be able to do that if you are doing very well in the 40 minute time frame now on coming to my personal uh, story in the cat uh, when i i chose the first set wrongly like uh, the set selection was fine i i messed up in the calculation and i was getting stuck now whenever you get stuck you'll feel like you are getting to the solution somewhere but uh, maybe if you juggle around a little bit with the numbers you'll get there but if there's 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 an ambiguity there right so 10 minutes had passed and i had not solved a single question and the set was i was stuck on that set now now comes the perennial question right should i stay on this set or should i move on to a next set uh my experience tells you that you can you should move on to the next set because uh if you've not been able to solve it in the last 10 minutes you need a break from that set and you need a fresh pair of eyes and just looking at the same problem and keeping keeping like keeping your eyes fixated fixated on that will not help you solve that problem right uh so move on to the next set which i did i moved on to the next set i solved it in the 12 minutes and then i moved on to the third set i solved it under again 10 minutes then i came back to the first set because at that point in time i had like six seven minutes remaining i can't start a new set it will take me a lot of time to figure out what the set is and i won't be able to do it in six seven minutes so i came back to the first set i cracked it because i was overlooking a very simple thing now had i stayed back uh, during the first 10 minutes and moved like try to solve it i would not have uh, noticed what i was doing wrong so getting that fresh pair of eyes and getting that break is crucial therefore move on to the next set as soon as possible and keep a timer as in five minute or six minute mark where you switch on to the next set if you're not able to solve it and if you're getting stuck it's the hardest thing to do trust me it's the hardest thing to leave a set uh, but you have to do it Right. So, guys, in the interest of time, I will just skip through the uh, next couple of slides. Uh, but uh, these are some sources of preparation that I had personally referred uh, during my time. Uh, you know, time has a great foundation problem bank for DILR. Anastasi Shankar sir has a great YouTube playlist that has about 300, 500 odd sets. Uh, Crack you has some great sets on its uh, YouTube playlist, and so does Elite's Great. Like uh, you can refer to these sources, like they should give you around 1,000, 1,500 sets to practice. Uh, that's good enough to, you know, start from the very basics and move to the very high quality ones. And, uh, you know, like they cover all the different difficulty levels, all the different genres by and large. So these should be able to, you know, cover most of the bases for you. And um, as, as a rule, I would recommend you build a habit of solving at least five sets every day uh, from any of these sources. Uh, so that uh, in the next, uh, what, six months, that's 180 days, 180 into five is 900. So if you keep a target of around 900 sets, even if you're able to do somewhere around 500, 500, 600, you are in a much better position than what you would be uh, otherwise. So build a habit of doing uh, at least four to five sets every day. And uh, these are some of my sources. You can, uh, you know, have some more as per your liking or as per what other panelists suggest. Uh, you can just uh, take a screenshot if that's what you would like, but we can move just, on if Sart everyone's Sartak, okay. I would just like to add, I think uh, people are getting afraid to seeing five sets, to solving at least five sets every day. So, see, I would like to tell, uh, try to solve the sets on your own. Don't look at the solution. Like if you're not able to solve the set today, try it tomorrow again. If not able to solve it tomorrow, try it two days later. Because it is very important that you reach the solution on your own. Yeah. Then you can look at the solutions and then you might uh, get help from the solution. Because when you are reaching the solution on your own, you are knowing what you need to do for a particular set. And you are also getting to know what you don't need to do for that set. Okay. So, like again, very it is... to look at the solution and just... Figure yeah. out. You would think that you are understanding it, but you are actually not. You have you have to solve it on your own to get the thrill out of it. Also, that it really motivates you to do another set. I mean, push your own limits. Like, ho gaya, ek aur karte hai. 
maybe during the initial days when it takes you like about 30 minutes 45 minutes to do a set you might not want to do five but as your speed improves and you are able to crack a set in 10 to 15 minutes try to develop a habit of uh, you know spending like an hour or so on dlr every day so that uh, you know you are regularly in the groove and it's not like uh, a weekly occurrence that you are taking up dlr okay uh, uh, one second moving on to the next slide yeah, so these are some solving styles that uh, we have uh, devised uh, or like, uh, you know, we have observed in our uh, experience so far. Uh, so Mridul is the classic example of the style one, right? He's the only person who can uh, go there and, um, you know, solve all four sets in the 40 minutes of time. And while I am someone on the hair, right? Like I, I choose to be a defend, uh, you know, a very defensive player. I choose to be someone who solves the bare minimum possible and uh, one thing that I want to highlight in a very, uh, you know, a humble way is that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you are uh, going all guns blazing or, you know, if you are like being a very defensive player like I am. Uh, I had a 99.75, Mridul um, has a 100. And you can see that, uh, you know, uh, all of these strategies will eventually lead you to a very high percentile. It's just that you don't have to model it based on somebody else that Mridul does this way, so I'll do it this way. Or maybe, uh, you know, Bhaskar does this way, so I'll also try to model him. You identify what kind of solver you are, right? So I, I will never go for all the four sets. I'll always try to choose the two easiest sets in the exam, right? And uh, Mridul will be like, you know, I'll like prioritize them, I'll rank them, and I'll solve all four of them. So all of them, all of these strategies work. You need to identify what works the best for you. That is the most uh, crucial thing in DLR, uh, I would say. Yeah, and all these strategies do have their own flaws as well. So you have to figure out what works best for you. Sometimes I would really get stuck and it would really get difficult for me to move on from one set. And that would uh, lead to me scoring very low in a few mocks as well. So it also depends upon the day. And I mean, you have to really be on your own toes and figure yeah. out what works best for you. Also, it's also a bit about how the paper itself is so for yeah. cat. 2019 slot one for example was like super easy like six sets was you would have been like a 99.5 99.6 right so i'm usually a greedy solver kind of person but if for that case i did like 5.5 6 7 sets right because at least i attempted seven sets and i could do that because i modified my strategy that this is very easy and accordingly you have to uh, do it and on the other hand if it was like cat 2020 slot two you have to be defensive. The paper was absolutely vicious. You go attack and you'll get like a lot of negatives, right? So uh, be flexible with your strategy. Yeah. And don't take it on your ego, right? That uh, I am an attacker, so I won't, uh, you know, modify my strategy as per the exam. Like ego is the last thing you would want to hamper your chances in DILR. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now uh, we had given you two sets in the, uh, you know, document that we shared yesterday. Uh, one was from CAT 2020 slot one, um, four Venn diagram on medicine. And one was from CAT 2022 slot one, uh, four Venn diagram on class activity. So you can let us know in the comments, uh, which of these would you like for us to do a live solve? Uh, since we are crunched for time, we can probably take up only one of these. So as per your, uh, you know, solving, which of these gave you more trouble, which of these would you like us to solve? We can take this up and... Uh, we can show you how we approach this and then we can open the floor for Q&A. Second. Okay. Uh, I'm not able to see the comments. Uh, are they seeing the second one? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, Mridul, uh, would you be able to take that up? Yeah, I'm just opening the question, setting it up. Sure, man. Sure, sure. Hey, I think uh, somebody asked in the comment, what do percentages uh, indicate in that uh, slide that I had shown? Uh, Mayank, uh, those percentages for me were, me personally, were the difficulty levels of uh, these different sources. So time had the easiest problem bank, uh, which is why I also rated it as foundation. Uh, Shankarji playlist was more of a mixed bag. It had the easy ones also, it had the difficult ones also, so I'll put it at 50%. And the uh, on the extreme end, I found Elite's Grid to have like really high quality sets. Uh, so that's why I put it at 90% because some of the sets were so vicious that even today I get uh, stuck at them. So those percentages just meant the difficulty level for me personally. Yeah. So is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah we can Wide see. Screen. We can see. So whiteboard. 
Yeah. So uh, this is a CAD 2022 slot one question site, which was my slot. And I'll just uh, walk you through how I would uh, approach it and how I would make notes on it and go through it because it is really important uh, so as to also minimize the amount of writing work that you're doing while solving a set, right? Because uh, every second that you save matters a lot. So uh, there are 15 girls. Just a second. Hello, yeah. So, uh, so there are 15 girls. Yeah. Sorry guys, I'm using this for the first time. So this is how I would write. There are 15 girls and some boys. Among them, uh, graduating students in a class, there are they are planning a get together, which can be either one day, two day, three day, uh, and there are six singers. Four of them are boys, so naturally two of them will be girls, and then there are ten dancers. Four of them are girls, so six of them will be boys. And there are no dancer and uh, singer overlap. So every student is either a dancer or a singer or none. So some students are, are interested in attending the get together are not interested in attending the get together. So there would be zero day people as well, right? Some students, uh, those students who are, attend are interested in attending a three day event are also interested in attending a two day event. And those who are, are interested in attending a two day event are also interested in attending a one day event. So uh, what this essentially means is that the number of people who are attending a three-day event would be a subset of the number of people who are attending a two-day event, which would be a subset of the number of people who are attending a one-day event, right? Did you all get that? Yeah. So, uh, and the total number of people who would be attending the event would, uh, would simply be the people who are not attending the event and the people who are attending the one-day event. Because if you're attending a, a one day event, that also uh, encompasses people who are uh, doing two and three. So uh, this is how I would make the table for it. Okay, so wait. So uh, there are some, uh, for, yeah, so there are people who are not uh, interested in attending the event as well. So this is how I would make the table for this. I'll need more columns. Yeah. So the number of boys, dance, uh, dancer boys, boys were dancers, girls were dancers, boys were singers, girls were singers, uh, people who are neither. Uh, so num number of boys were neither, and number of girls were neither. And then I'll just write total boy, girls and boys with a slash between because I'm running out of a bit space. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, all the girls and 80% of the boys are interested in attending a one day event. So all the girls. So uh, we have a total of 15 girls, right? So are attending in one day event and there are uh, 54, 54, this would be nine. So total number of girls is 15. So I've just subtracted two and four from it. So I get other girls as uh, nine for the one day event. 
and 80% of boys. So I've taken the total number of boys as X. So 80% uh, of the boys are attending this day. Some of the girls are interested in attending a one-day event, but not a two-day event. Uh, some of the girls are interested in attending a both. So this, what this essentially means is uh, that on day two, uh, all the girls are not attending the two-day event. Some of them are only attending the one-day event. So this would not be 15. This would be less than 15 for total number of girls on two day. 70% of the boys who are interested in attending a two-day event are neither singers uh, nor dancers. So 70% of this, did I miss a point? Oh, I missed this point that 60% of the boys are interested in attending a two-day event, which is a uh, 0.6. Right, 0.66. I'm sorry if it is a bit clumsy. I'm using this for the first time. Yeah. So 70% of the boys who are interested in attending a two-day event are neither singers nor dancers. So 70% of this 0.6x, right? Which would be 0.42x. Now, when I... When I reached this point, uh, I what I did during my uh, attempt, I converted this into a fraction, which would be 42 by 100 X, which would simply be 21 X by 50. Now, as I earlier stated that I tried to identify these properties in these numbers. And uh, I understand that this X now is a multiple of 50. It could be 50, 100, 150. Now, uh, I was running a low on time. And I noticed that the number of girls is 15. So uh, what I did here was I straight away took X as 50 and I solved the set. And that did work out because X did turn out to be 50 in the end. Also, if you notice that uh, on, a, on a slightly funny note that this set has been created by a B school and they are really uh, focused on diversity. So they would not want to keep X very high as 100 or 150, right? So some sort of psychology that clicked was I should take X 50 and it did work out eventually. Yeah. So uh, moving ahead, let's just solve it. Yeah, these kind of logics only get you all the way. <laughs> So was that? no girl is interested in attending a three-day event. So for all the girls, three-day events would be zero. All male singers and two of the dancers are interested in attending a three-day event. So all the male singers, there are four male singers and two of the dancers. Now we know that none of the girl dancers are interested. So both the male dancers would be interested in attending a two-day event. The number of... <laughs> the number of singers interested in attending a two-day event is one more than the number of dancers interested in attending a two-day event. Okay, so uh, we slightly go back to the point where it was written that if those who are interested in attending a three-day event are also interested in attending a two-day event, and those who are interested in two-day are also interested in one-day, right? So uh, when we know that the number of male singers who are uh, boy singers who are uh, interested in attending a three-day event is four, then they would have uh, attended a two-day event as well as a one-day event, and this would mean become zero. Similarly, uh, this would be two. Just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the uh, the number of singers attend interested in attending a two-day event is one more than the number of dancers interested in attending a two-day event. So if this was point four two x, then the number of boys from these two would be point one eight x, right? And uh, we see that the maximum number of boys that we have for this is ten. So uh, from here, you can calculate that X comes out to be uh, for here. Uh, we need a calculator for this. Yeah. 
x would be less than 55 point something, right? 55.55555. And you get x as 50 from here as well. When you get x as 50, you start resubstituting the values. You get x basically less than 55.55 from here. And we had earlier find out, found out that x is a multiple of 50. So we get uh, x as 50 now. Am I clear in that? Can someone just say yes or no? Yeah. So I'll have to just, it is a bit, the values. So this was 0.8x. Fuck it, yeah. So can one of you please address the questions in the query? I'm just really struggling with this, uh, getting the table and all sorted. So, uh, okay, Rahul, when you get 0.18x less than 10, because 10 is the maximum number of boy dancers and uh, boy singers combined, right? So uh, when you calculate x less than uh, 10 by 0.18x, you get x less than 55.55, right? Rahul, can you please respond? Hello. Yeah. So, and we did earlier find out that x was... Uh, 42 by, uh, what was it? 21, 21 by 50, right? For the other boys. So we understand that X has to be a natural number, right? Because it represents a number of people. So that is how we understood that X has to be a multiple of 50. And uh, the only multiple of 50 less than 55.55 is 50. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. I'll just read up all the statements again. Yeah. All the girls and 80% of the boys are interested in all the girls. All the girls and 80% of the boys are interested in the number. Sixty percent of the boys are attend interested in attending a two-day event, right? Some of the girls are interested in attending a one day event. Some of the girls are interested in attending a two day event. So, yeah, so we have some of the girls are interested in, in attending a two day event, and some of them interested in attending, but not a two day event. Some of the girls are interested in attending both. Right. So, uh, yeah, so the number of girls would be less than 15 here. That is something that we have found out. 
seventy percent of the boys were interested in attending a two-day event. Mrithul, I would like to suggest that uh, you know if this is uh, getting stuck, you can probably shoot a video after this uh, session gets over and then send it to the WhatsApp group that these students are a part of. Yeah, I mean actually managing it with the screen is getting a bit messy. Yeah. No, no, I can understand. Yeah, I'm looking, looking, it's the first time that I'm doing this, especially with the uh, you know the pen not working properly. Yeah, guys, is that okay? Can you just reply with a yes in the comments if uh, we can shoot a video and send it to you after the session gets over? We'll do that by today end of day positively. Sorry guys, we uh, it took a lot of time to first configure this. We had planned to show you the Josephus problem as well earlier, but we could not do that. Yeah, we'll share the solution to the puzzles uh, and both the sets uh, with you. Hey, thank you so much, guys. I I think uh, Mridul people are okay. We can uh, you know. Thank you so much, guys. This. Send it to them. We can uh, guys, so. Uh, that was all, all we had planned. Uh, yeah, Bhaskar, you were saying something. No, I was saying we can open the floor for question and answers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, if you have uh, any questions that you would like us to address, uh, please uh, you can unmute yourself, raise your hand, and let us know. Uh, yes, we go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. So, so actually, I have four particular questions with regards to LRDA. So, uh, first of all, as I uh, mentioned, that we uh, we should you know not look at solutions and rather we should solve ourselves. So basically, the problem with me is that um, like uh, when I solve the questions like the sets, I do it by my own method. So it it can be by hook and hook or crook. I just get to the solution and and most of the times it is correct. But then whenever I go and watch the videos and I I just completely see that okay this wasn't you know the actual method. I just got to the answer and it also happened in Cat Twenty Two that luckily I got a good percentile by hook or crook, but didn't even solve the uh, solve the second set itself. So that was one thing that uh, you know like how do i address that oh, i i completely get to the answer but you know not through the correct method uh, secondly uh, uh, like uh, sh should i go sequence wise uh, so that you could answer and then i'll ask or like i should uh, ask the questions first like the, like the whole list of questions i have four questions you can answer one by one yeah yeah sure yeah that way we can also give time to you know couple of other folks also uh, I hope that's okay, right, Vipul? Yeah, uh, I, I'll just make the second one very quick then. It, it is also very important for everyone else. So yeah, sure. Let, let's answer yeah, the so, first one, then we can come to the second one. So that yeah, sure, uh, sure. I will take the question. Uh, so, Vipul, see, LRDI set solving, there are various methods you can solve the sets. It is not that the solutions which are given are only correct. Okay, your method will also be correct. So, you don't need to be afraid of that. The reason why we are telling that for, to you all to look at the solution, it is because you will find how to organize the information in a structured way. That's the only reason. Okay. Yeah, got it. Uh, so, uh, so in regards to the analysis of the mock, uh, if you could just guide me through how is the analysis done? Uh, because uh, does that entail uh, that we should be redoing each and every set uh, after after attempting the mock, or should we only be uh, redoing or you know just uh, let's say if I've solved two sets and I've not solved the other two, uh, should I just watch the videos of the ones that I've not solved or redo redo the uh, remaining two or redo each and every set once again and then watch the videos and what about the book of mistakes one of the panelists had mentioned about book of mistakes what does that contain because um, in terms of uh, you know making a uh, DILR can also have some sort of tricks and all that people maintain but what about the book of mistakes uh, and how should we effectively revise because in terms of revising for DILR I guess so whenever I want to revise for DILR for any particular set that I'm marking which is very important I have to redo it once again rather than you know uh, for a QA question I, I can just look through the solution that I've made but for DILR I have to totally uh, do it once again see 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 First of all, looking through any solution, be it DILR, be it QA, it will never help you. Okay. You can look as many times, you will again have to do it. 
for dilr set that is why we were emphasizing on the point you have to reach the solution on your own for dilr set because then that solution gets fixed in your brain i think mridul will also agree with that yeah and on the point of analyzing mocks uh, so when you are analyzing the dilr section you are not analyzing the questions you are analyzing your strategy how you went about it did you miss out on an easy set were you stuck on a difficult set these are the first things that you analyze then you should ideally solve the sets that you missed out on again and if you solve something say a, a set you solved that but you took say 20 minutes 25 minutes then how can you reduce the time taken to solve that set these are the aspects that you should be focused more on while you're analyzing the mocks then rather than uh, i'm having to redo it or i mean these are uh, you have to just uh, find your way through it whatever works best for you but uh, don't be uh, don't find a shortcut as to why i have to do it again right if you're very confident that it was like a simple di set and i could do it in 10 minutes then there's no need to do that again right but if there was a uh, table filling set which could have been done say in 20 12 minutes but you took 25 minutes then you should ideally do it again but after a week or so okay so thank you uh so one what... more you can unmute okay thanks for the opportunity uh, so i have problem with the open ended questions like the first question of the venn diagram that we had in the practice session was an close end set close ended option we had all the values fetched out of it but where we have to maximize and minimize the uh, fields any particular values i face problem there particularly so what can we do about that like i don't have any particular resources as well to prepare for it so can you recommend anything i mean you can try to find a certain question of similar sort which has been solved online in some youtube video or in some other resource and then maybe learn from that because if you're stuck somewhere then you have to look at the solution and understand the approach that the person is using to get to the answer right mm -hmm. but uh, for the maximization and minimization problems yeah, like so you need to uh, have the approach as to i mean for that particular question what is needed to maximize it right that mm -hmm. might be different for a two two venn diagram three venn diagram or a four venn diagram there are different parameters so yes. uh, it is a very specific thing based on that question how you need to maximize or minimize and i don't think we remember these things we just have that instinct to go it to go, uh, take a dig at it the particular way if you have okay. some uh, question particularly you could dm us or send it to us and then we can look into it but i mean just in uh, arbitrarily telling you that this is how you will maximize it or this is how you will minimize it uh, no, not think... the particular approach for a problem yeah like just the like for example the first venn diagram question that we had we could fetch out all the values all particular values whereas for the second set we had to like jump into like make a quick guess or yeah. like like did 50 values missing ha huh, correct 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 yeah which had a range of so, values possible for correct that. correct yeah. so how do we approach this particular uh, it will come by practice we... only it will improve by practice only yeah i would suggest mm -hmm. you to first look into a video of similar sort of a question that would give mm -hmm. you some clarity because uh, basically when it is a maximization or a minimization problem we look at the extreme values right between the range we try to find out uh, the maximum value that a particular field can take or the minimum value that a particular field can take so if there are two parameters and we need to maximize one of them so we try to minimize the other mm -hmm. that is how we go about it right all right all right thanks thank you so much <laughs> Rajesh, you can ask your doubt. Oh uh, yes. Um. So like, there's a scenario which you know happens to me quite often in mocks, and happened to me last year in CAT as well. Like, I spend some time initially three four minutes in selection process. There's always one set that you know I always find pretty doable. After that, what happens is that I'm confused between a uh, second and third set as to which to start first. Like both seem quite doable on the surface, but like. only if i spend some time on that 5 10 minutes then only i can judge the you know difficulty of that that takes a lot of time and i'm not you know left with much time for the third set if i get stuck in the second set as well so how do you like you know how do you handle such situations when you are able to solve one set but you are confused which to attempt next as to like how can you judge the difficulty of it just by reading it or do you attempt or spend 5 10 minutes initially in that as well i guess it is again the case of familiarity first 
then we have some maybe i would look at if the answers are definite or not hmm. there are multiple cases possible these are the some finer checks that we do every time and okay. these are something that you develop with practice again i mean there is no this perfect strategy or that you need to follow and you will ace it right we hmm. all are there in the uh, i understand that you all are in the planning stage and that you would like to have this perfect way things should work out but that is uh, not the case you have to make mistakes you will figure it figure them out through your mistakes and eventually you will get there if you put in the amount of time and effort which is needed just don't worry so much about the ex- just start with the execution don't worry so much about planning the perf- planning it out the perfect way mm-hmm. and we are all uh, there on linkedin or on telegram then you can always reach out to us if you are facing some problem with uh, a particular problem while attending a mock I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't think a lot of people have given too many mocks, right? I mean, most people did vote that they had not given a lot of mocks. So most of you are still in the planning stages, and just take it easy and get your hands dirty. Just attempt some mocks, and then you will get clarity slowly and steadily. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I would just like to add one thing. So, like you asked, I think many of the uh, aspirants will have this problem, like. how do we identify just by reading it whether the set is complex or not exactly so it is like with practice when you are reading the sets many a times you can see the blueprint of the solutions in your mind suppose there is a arrangement sets and you are reading it and you know that how do you want to approach it how to approach that type of sets okay now when you are thinking about the blueprint like how you want to approach the set in dilr the main wastage of time happens there while select yeah so that time will reduce only with practice and the more type of sets you get familiar got it thank you yeah. okay and, and whether to use a when or whether to use a table to represent the same data sometimes you will get confused but with practice you will figure it out you will start have building mental maps and while you are reading also you will start using these like when i was representing the data i was not writing them as dancer six boys i was using short hands right so these are things that you develop with practice exactly and like i said before for brc also like any approach any process which you follow it will take you at least 2 to 3 months to see the result of that effort okay sir any more questions anyone i think uh, shrijan has a question regarding which mocks you should buy for practice and uh, full length tests as well uh so shrijan i would say that uh, me I, i particularly use the time material very extensively because that comes with the foundation bank and uh, i i find that very useful to build my basics so uh, time uh, ims and crack you these are the three that i had used uh, and i can say uh, with surety that all three of them provide quality content uh, time particularly i preferred uh, for their uh, you know super organized foundational bank and uh, super extensive also uh, so that that was my top pick uh, i think mridul and baskar have also had experience of cl so they can elaborate on that uh, if they recommend it yeah see cl time ims thank you you can buy any two at least by any two every one, every each of these are good but just know that like yesterday also we mentioned buy a test series which has high number of test takers so that you get a fair idea about your percentile also you need like means if you are competing with uh, 400 people and you are rank 50 you will feel 50 is good but in percentile terms it will be not so keep that in sarthak sir so, uh, i have a small question for you uh, you were referring to time materials so of time material you mean the modules the handouts the practice questions that are there on no no not not that not that uh, when you enroll for the test series uh, okay. there are multiple variants so one of the variants is the advanced variant which also gives you the sectional tests and the uh, problem bank so okay. if you go for that uh, that that should cover 
uh, you don't need to enroll for their uh, you know classroom program or self study program where you get the modules and all it's all online along with the mocks you'll get the sectionals and the you know okay like the question you. back you are referring to sartak like they have some sort of a topic wise uh, sort of yes yes tests in that correct correct they they have topic wise tests in that uh, so they will run you through all the topics you know uh, like routes and networks games and tournaments arrangements this and that like they have a very vast coverage and i can attest to it because i built my dilr basics from the time foundation bank which comes with the advanced test series so like i i can attest it, it's very structured it's very organized and uh, covers nearly everything that you need to know for the basics right thank you anything else guys you can wrap up the session then yeah in case if you have any more doubts uh, you can put it on the whatsapp group with the team inside i am and uh, we can uh, address those uh, as and when we come we can address the questions in the next session also yeah yeah, yeah. but i would uh, recommend there are there is like only 45 minutes for the next session so you can go and have your lunch we'll meet you in another 40 45 minutes guys thank you guys thank you guys see you all thank you thanks everyone bye